Hi, I'm Maximilian Alvarez. I'm the editor-in-chief of The Real News Network and host of the podcast Working People. And this is the art of class war on breaking points. Firstly, I want to start by wishing everyone out there a happy belated May Day or International Workers' Day, which was on May 1st earlier this week. And today, in the spirit of May Day, I want to talk to you about the workplace as a site of struggle, a place where power and control are often consolidated at the top, but also where power can be collectively challenged and more of it can be transferred to and exerted by those at the bottom. And we're gonna focus on one particular way that many of us are taught to deal with or resolve this struggle, quitting. I wanna start by telling you two of the most unremarkable stories you've ever heard. They are unremarkable because I'm positive that all of us have told similar stories at one point or another. Like many of you, I've had a lot of different jobs in the past. I was a pizza delivery guy before smartphones existed, uh, back when managers would literally print out directions for deliveries and tape them onto the orders. I've worked a bunch of different retail jobs. I've worked at a frozen yogurt shop and I've taught in college classrooms. I was a waiter in Chicago and I've been a temp laborer working in different warehouses and factories in Southern California, some as boring as you can imagine, some as nightmare filled as an Upton Sinclair book. But my first real job, which I basically got the day after I turned 16, thanks to my big brother Zach, was at a small Mexican restaurant chain in Orange County called Pepe's. And that must have been around 2002. So the job was basically what you'd expect. Exhausting lunch and dinner rushes, followed by slow hours filled with cleaning and shooting the shit with coworkers, loud cooks cracking jokes in Spanish, awesome custom burritos that we got to make during our lunch breaks, the absolute worst smelling bathrooms you've ever been in, <laughs> and, uh, and a drive through monitor that beeped so loudly when a new car pulled up that it felt like an ice pick being jammed into the base of your skull. And one day, that beep finally got to me. Honestly, I had only been at Pepe's for a few months and it was fine. You know, I didn't love it, but I loved the food and it was a paycheck. But the manager I worked with was, most of the time, a, a real piece of shit, pardon my French. And one day he got drunk with the head cook in the back and they basically both passed out in the walk-in fridge. Then the lunch rush came. And it was just me, that awful drive through beep, and a new cook who only spoke Spanish and had been there for about one week. Now, I've been through much worse in my life since then, <laughs> but uh, at the time, this felt like some straight up BS that I just really didn't want to put up with. Again, I was still fairly new. I didn't have any sway with the owners to do anything about the manager, so I quietly put in my two weeks and I quit. And I found a seasonal job at the mall. See, I told you, unremarkable. Now, the other unremarkably common experience I had was standing on the hard, hot, concrete floor of a boiling warehouse after a 12 or 13 hour shift, drenched in sweat, panting alongside 15 to 20 other panting bodies of various ages, listening to the steely plodding of the floor manager's boots as she walked up the line, pointing at the people she wanted to come back for more work the next day. People who all had families to support and lives to live outside of that hot box. I remember those moments. I remember saying the names of products that we shipped on repeat under my breath just to keep my brain busy until the manager got to me and I knew if I still had a paycheck coming. This was in 2011, just over 10 years ago, in the wake of the Great Recession. Now, Every single person standing on that concrete warehouse floor knew how much we all needed the jobs, however shitty they were. And everyone had their own mix of reasons. Financial necessity, obviously, that was the main one, but it could be to pay off student loans or to pay a mortgage 
car payments, children's school expenses, etc., etc. And some had to hold on to the jobs for dear life because their paroles depended on it. Either way, there was no real sense of freedom in that situation. I had no choice but to be there. I had no choice but to take our manager's crap. I couldn't find any better options. Few of us could. And management knew that. They knew, like we all did, that every morning there would be a huddled mass of faceless silhouettes standing in the dark parking lot outside at four in the morning, waiting to see if someone didn't show up for their shift. These are just small, unremarkable snapshots of two completely mundane moments in my working life. My first time quitting a job, which just so happened to be my first job, gave me a very specific impression of my power and agency as an individual worker. This was before Wall Street and a whole mess of greedy people crashed the economy. This was when I was still living at home and didn't have extra expenses like rent and childcare. This was a time in my life when it felt true that I had the ability to protest bad pay or working conditions by refusing to subject myself to them and leaving. And you know that helped bolster my young conservative conviction that the system was working as it should and that this was me acting accordingly in it. The situation at the warehouse was entirely different. I had no real agency there. I needed the money and this was the only job I could get. At that point, uh, three years after the financial crash, I had begun to see how that system I once had so much faith in was doing everything it could to protect the wealthy and the powerful while tossing working people overboard left and right. Every night after work, sitting in a living room full of so many memories, in a house that we would soon lose for good, my folks and I would sink deeper into a depressive abyss as we heard talking heads and partisan hacks sing triumphantly about an economic recovery that seemed to be just passing us by. Like so many others, we felt stuck, trapped, helpless. But here's my point. Whether I was a cashier at Pepe's at a time when the economy still felt like it was working and social mobility still seemed like a real possibility, or whether I was working as a warehouse temp at a time when the world itself seemed to have broken apart and we were all just hanging on for dear life. At neither point, and at almost no other point in my life, did I think there was a third option besides quit and brave the elements, or don't quit, stay, and take the crap. At no real point did I or my coworkers think seriously about staying and doing something together to fix the problems that we faced at work. Now that's not to say, of course, that there weren't beautiful, tender, life-saving moments of camaraderie and solidarity. Moments when a senior worker would stick up for me. Moments when servers and cooks and busboys formed an unspoken pact to never leave women on staff alone with certain managers. Moments when we actually enjoyed our work together, covered in sweat, listening to music, stacking and loading pallets and feeling like we accomplished something and that we were worth a damn. At many of the jobs I've had, coworkers commiserated and laughed together. We hung out and learned about each other's lives and we built bonds together that held outside of work. But we never organized and we never thought about organizing. And when people would quit, it was almost always a hushed affair. At best, we'd have, you know, a little send-off ceremony in the break room on their last day. And, you know, if they quit over problems at work, we just quietly, you know, nodded our heads, understanding full well why they couldn't take it anymore, while accepting that the problems themselves would go unacknowledged and would remain unchanged. There was no moment of reckoning or self-reflection from management. Departing employees were either quickly forgotten or remembered only as disgruntled, dysfunctional troublemakers. Over the past year, however, 
something has changed. With the phenomenon that we've come to know as the Great Resignation, record numbers of people have been voluntarily quitting their jobs, reaching a height of 4.5 million people quitting in November of 2021 alone, the highest number since the Bureau of Labor Statistics started tracking that data. Last year, we saw a ghoulish chorus of business owners, chamber of commerce puppets, and corporate serving politicians plastered on every major news network, berating working people back into pre-pandemic subservience by calling us lazy and entitled, making baseless claim after baseless claim about how no one wants to work anymore, and then using those baseless claims to justify ending vital COVID relief programs instead of asking themselves why so many people were increasingly unwilling to take low paying, dead end, unsafe, or overexhausting jobs where they were treated as disposable. But historic numbers of workers standing up for themselves forced their hand and changed the narrative, including workers like Beth McGrath, a Walmart employee whose viral resignation video was covered on Breaking Points a while back. Take a listen. All right. Attention Walmart shoppers and associates, my name is Beth from Electronics, I've been working at Walmart for almost five years and I can say that everyone here is overworked and underpaid. The attendant policy is we are treated from management and customers poorly every day. Whenever we have a problem with it, we're told that we're replaceable. I'm tired of the constant gaslighting. This company treats their elderly associates like sh manage it and this job, I quit. Now, notice McGrath's deep breathing before she makes her announcement. I could feel that. I could feel her breathing in my own chest. I've felt that same trepidation and fear. I've dreamed of doing what people like her have done over the past year, but I never did. There's no one reason why so many people have been taking that step to quit their jobs. And those reasons vary depending on the person, and the job, but the fact that so many have taken that step and the fact that brave people like Beth have refused to go quietly has meant that employers haven't gotten to exercise the power they typically have to control the terms and determine the learned or unlearned lessons of their employees' departures. Even if these record numbers of quits weren't part of some coordinated collective action, the fact that they have happened en masse and gotten so much attention has meant that the balance of power has shifted ever so slightly. And it's that cumulative mass effect that has forced many employers to actually look inward, raise wages, improve safety conditions and work flexibility, and make better offers to potential hires. And that is significant but the gains are also unevenly distributed, insecure, and always at risk of rollbacks. I mean, inflation has already outpaced the average wage growth from last year, for instance. From companies unilaterally ripping their pandemic hero pay bumps away from workers to corporate pirates and landlords gleefully jacking up prices on all of us, We've seen how ruthlessly the order-giving class will always try to steal back any moderate gains that working people make. And I don't say this to minimize the truly historic importance of the Great Resignation and the sea change it represents in people's basic relationship to work and in their very own sense of self-worth. I am deeply proud of anyone who has ever had the bravery to say, I am worth more than this, because you are. No matter what the system, your boss, our politicians, or certain toxic bootlicking people in your life may tell you, we are worth more, we deserve more, and we need to fight for more. What I'm saying is that 
there are limits to what quitting can do for us in that fight. Ultimately, it is every individual's decision to make. There is no one-size-fits-all solution here, and I want to be very clear that sometimes the absolute best and safest and healthiest thing to do is quit your job. And the fact that so many people have been looking out for themselves, believing that they deserve better, and taking that leap to prove it is mind-blowing and I think an extremely positive thing. But what is also mind-blowing is that there are a lot of working people in this country who also felt that way and still feel that way, who also believe that they deserve better and who are proving it by staying where they are and fighting for a better and more humane work life. For example, Uh, I was up on Staten Island for The Real News two weeks ago to cover the Amazon Labor Union rally, which was held uh, before a second and ultimately unsuccessful union election at the LDJ5 Sorting Center, which is in the same Amazon complex as the JFK 8 Fulfillment Center that successfully voted to unionize last month. Now, since I got back uh, from Staten Island, a lot of people have been asking me to convey what, uh, what the workers there are doing and why they're doing it. Well, this is pretty much it in a nutshell. You know, my message as always is don't listen to me, listen to the workers themselves. And this is what workers have been repeatedly saying. We actually published a compilation of on the ground interviews and speeches from the rally on my podcast, Working People. So I'm gonna play a clip for you from that episode um, from my interview with Michelle Valentin Nieves a worker organizer with the Amazon Labor Union who works at the JFK 8 warehouse that made history by successfully unionizing last month. Initially, there was none, you know, there was no conversation. And then um, things started picking up in the direction of organizing when we lost our former manager. And I think we were in limbo for about four months. Mm -hmm. And even then, there was overseeing managers we saw maybe twice a week, if even that. We had an overseeing ASM for a bit as well, but no store manager and all these things that we wanted to change. And it was passing comments, I want to say, in between transitioning, between morning to mid-shift. You had partners coming in wondering, like, why isn't this getting done? Uh, Why are so many people calling out? Why do I only have two people for the afternoon rush? Mm -hmm. And having nobody to console, (laughs) I remember just like, lower your voice. (laughs) Like, you're going to get us in trouble. Uh But it was within that same day, I was like, if you're serious, text me after work and I'll I'll let you know because I'm down. Mm -hmm. And I think in like record time, I want to say two or three days, more than 70% of our store was already hanging out after work, talking about the things we want to see change. And we really just were leaning on one another for once in, you know, months. And I really think it was that domino effect of losing a manager who genuinely cared so much about us and who was driven out for the very same reason that we were driven to organize, mm-hmm. not being accommodated for, not being considered, being overlooked and almost bullied. Mm-hmm. And so... And, and were there, like, at the, so, like, at the time, was, had the Buffalo store unionized at this point? Oh, yeah. Yeah? When I tell you it was fast, it was fast. When did our store file? August, it was April, was it, it was, like, two weeks ago on a Thursday. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I was so struck hearing Michelle and other Amazon workers describe how they took that sense of helpless individual desperation and you know through hard work and worker to worker organizing through countless conversations turn that into collective power and a collective commitment to stay and fight all of the things that we know about amazon and how it treats its workers apply here backbreaking high speed heavily surveilled work in massive warehouses undemocratic, top-down decisions that directly affect workers' health, safety, and livelihoods, union-busting consultants, captive audience meetings, 
workers berated by anti-union propaganda left and right, retaliation and even arrests of organizers. But one thing that's important to note is, you know, it's not like workers' jobs are hell on earth every hour of every single day. There are parts of their jobs that they like. There are reasons it's better for them or more preferable to work there than to work somewhere else. Many couldn't easily leave and many didn't want to. And it was clear that Jeff Bezos, Amazon HR, or anyone in elective office wasn't going to answer workers' cries for help out of the goodness of their own hearts. So workers took it upon themselves to do something about it. And you know, this is the same thing that's been happening with Starbucks workers around the country. When I got to interview workers at the North Charles store in Baltimore, who also made history by becoming the first unionized Starbucks in Maryland last week in a clean sweep election, they told me that a lot of the workers there were trans like them. And it was a special place in that way. And they also, for those reasons, really needed the healthcare benefits. And so they didn't want to leave. What is truly amazing, I think, is that they are doing what I and I imagine many of you have never really thought about doing. Banding together and exerting power to make this place where we spend so much of our lives because we have to work, a better place to work. For many of us, that seems like an impossible task. But if you look at Starbucks workers and what they are doing right now, you see how possible it really is. Just watch this clip of my Real News interview with Ariana Ayala, a Starbucks partner in New York City and a member of her store's organizing committee, where she describes how quickly things got moving once she and her coworkers started talking openly about doing something to improve their situation at work. The second year I did um, RT shift, which is, that's the 12 hour shift. Mm -hmm. So I did that, that's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, 12 hour shift. I did that for a whole year. And um, I, like once I did it, I'd say like maybe eight to nine months, it started like affecting my health and my energy levels and the way I was behaving at home. Like I was like snappy at home. I was always in a bad mood. Uh, it put like a lot of stress on like my relationship and my relationship with my my family and my kids, and it was just like wow. After that second year of doing RT, I was like, okay, I have to change something because doing this 12 hours, it was just like pounding on my body, physically and mentally. It was just like a lot. Then I also uh, there was a pandemic. <laughs> going yeah, on. <laughs> exactly. Let's not forget the pandemic. Mm -hmm. That's another thing that was just like, that was much, that was like pretty much the stick that broke the horse's back. Mm -hmm. Like when the pandemic came out and everyone has to work twice as hard and no one was given a break. People were coming out with COVID left and right. Some people came back to work, some people didn't. There's pe people that we don't even know if, if they passed away, if they recovered. We don't even know because Amazon keeps everything a secret. Um, so it, it was just a lot. It was like all of those things combined. Um, but for the union itself, I think the pandemic was really what pushed it to the point where they were like, okay, we have to do this. Like, we have no other choice. Right. Like, it got people so desperate to the point where we were like, okay, we're going to do this. Because it, there's only like, at this point, there's only like 20 of us, but it started out with like maybe four people mm -hmm. originally. It was like maybe four or five people. So it had to, you had to like really be pushed to the point where, okay, I'm desperate. I'm desperate for change. And this is what we're going to have to do. Well, that's it. We're just going to do it. We're going to keep at it until something changes or something happens. Talking to workers like Ariana, I often find myself thinking back to so many times at so many different jobs when I heard some version of that same refrain. If you don't like it, why don't you just leave? Now, we've all heard this phrase before. Sometimes it's posed as a genuine question. Sometimes as a suggestion. Other times, it's snarled as an insult that you're really not expected to respond to. And I want to focus on that for a second, because the fact, that there, because the fact is that there are a number of different meanings packed into that blunt question. If you don't like what you've got right now, why don't you just switch, abandon your post, and leave it for some other poor soul to deal with? You know, when I first heard this question, the logic 
rang true in a sort of consumer type way, right? It was similar to when people would ask if you don't like this or that brand of cereal or this news channel or this phone service provider, then why don't you just exercise your power as a consumer and switch providers or buy a different brand or watch a different channel? And, you know, it was that sentiment that led me to quit that first high school job at Pepe's. In a marketplace where businesses are supposedly competing with one another for customers and workers, it felt like I could leverage that to improve my own lot in life. And, you know, that may have been true once, but it is increasingly not the case these days. Instead, what we've got is 90% of media operations being owned by four mega corporations. These new techno monopolies like Amazon, Facebook, and Google, and Apple are gobbling up every square inch of our digital world, just like big agriculture and the factory farming industry are gobbling up all the farmland and polluting the literal shit out of the surrounding area. And, you know, just like most consumer products are owned by a handful of industry behemoths. The illusion of a competitive marketplace and the power of consumer choice is increasingly giving way to an oligopolistic economy where our ability to move and make the market respond to our needs is dwindling down more and more by the day. And that really is the whole end game here. Because once the question was, if you don't like it, why don't you just leave? What they want the question to be is, well, where else are you going to go? And they use their power and their influence to make sure the question is already answered for us. You know, workers' unrestricted freedom to reject insufficient working situations by leaving is necessary to make the whole social contract of capitalist society worth it, in theory. In practice, it doesn't really work that way. It's a lot more complicated. Just like human beings, we are much more complicated than that. Sometimes there aren't other jobs to be had. Sometimes you really like your job and you don't want to leave. Sometimes it would cause life-altering disruptions to you and your family to lose even one day of pay, and so you can't leave. And the more that you think about this, the more that you start to get into the real deep shit that working people have been asking themselves for centuries. How free am I really in this system? We'll, we'll save that for another day, but the point is we have to have more power than quitting in this system allows. If the power that we were promised, the power to use our feet to dictate our own futures and to discipline employers into doing better by their workers is constantly being eroded, we need to build that power back up. And you know, I think the great resignation shows how essential that power is. But we need more than that. And we deserve more than that. We need power in the workplace. We need people staying and fighting. We need to push for the changes that we want to see, and then we need to lock those changes into a binding contract. We need to build strong and durable infrastructures for workers to get and stay organized, because true power in the workplace comes from the collective. What they want is to rig the game so that a heavily organized and well-resourced ruling class is always going up against a permanently disorganized and atomized working class. Because they know, as is always the case, that there are more of us than there are of them. If we organize ourselves, if we stand together, like workers around this country and around the world are standing together right now, if we stay and fight, we can win. It's more possible than you think. Just look at Starbucks. Look at Amazon. Because what scares the bosses more than anything is the day when workers realize that. And that day is coming. Thank you for watching this segment with Breaking Points. 
And be sure to subscribe to my news outlet, The Real News, with links in the show description. See you soon for the next edition of The Art of Class War. Solidarity forever. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms, for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.